um, for 25 years, and she's worked building and collaborating with a wide range of women's, men's, youth, and LGBTQ plus organizations. She has been a member of the Council for uh, Responsible for Political Behavior, the Spotlight uh, Program, Civil Society, National Reference Group for Trinidad and Tobago, and the UWI's representative on the Spotlight Regionary, um, Regional Steering Committee. And for those of you who, uh, just to refresh what Spotlight is, Spotlight is an initiative sponsored by the European Union in partnership with the United Nations to end all forms of gender-based violence. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Gabriel Hussein. And this is a, a live uh, video. Good morning, everyone. And um, my thanks to Pride TT for having me here. My greetings to the directors, Faye Fernandez and Rudolf Hanamji, to um, all the diplomatic missions who are represented here, all protocols observed, um, to the business community that is participating in this um, and to the allies that have been working in this area for a long time. Um, my greetings to you and of course to my CSO uh, collaborators in the field, for example, from um, CAISO, from Women's Caucus, from Trans Coalition of Trinidad and Tobago and uh, Youth Votes Matter and to to all others, good morning. I, um, I'm here today to talk for just a few minutes about the Equal Opportunity Commission. And I think what's important is that uh, the EOC continue to emphasize our public education mandate and provide clarifications regarding our work and our jurisdiction. For those of you who may not know, the Equal Opportunity Act was assented to in 2000, and it protects people from discrimination on the basis of a number of status categories, such as race and ethnicity, religion, um, place of origin, including geography, marital status, and disability and sex. The word gender is not included in the act, and it does not protect on the basis of a number of other kinds of status categories, such as health status, age, and of course, sexual orientation. It does protect in terms of a number of areas, such as accommodation, housing, education, and provision of goods and services. Something that I think is also important to say about the Equal Opportunity Commission is that the Equal Opportunity Act created two very distinct bodies. One is the EOC, uh, where I'm vice chair, and one is the Equal Opportunity Tribunal, which is chaired and adjudicated by a judge. And in the recent press that was had on the Equal Opportunity Commission, many people painted the EOC and the EOT together as a broad brush, as a singular institution, but in fact, their responsibilities are distinct. And the Equal Opportunity Tribunal is a court. The Equal Opportunity Commission is an institution that is meant to provide um, an investigation of complaints that come, uh, opportunities for conciliation, uh, recommendations regarding, you know, whether or not uh, these constitute um, valid cases of discrimination that can then be taken up in the court, but they are two different uh, institutions. The Equal Opportunity Commission also has a responsibility to produce research and to engage in broad public education to help create a national climate in which non-discrimination is valued and to review the Equal Opportunity Act and to make provisions for expansion of the protected status categories as well as um, to make recommendations regarding legislation broadly in order to ensure a more non-discriminatory non legislative framework. 
In that context, um, and many of you would know the work that was led by the late Colin Robinson, uh, founder of the Ki of Kaiso, to expand the status categories that are protected by the Equal Opportunity Act. And under the former chair, Ms. Lynette Seberan Sweet, since 2016, the Equal Opportunity Commission has supported that advocacy, particularly to uh, protect persons from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And so I don't only want to bring greetings today on behalf of the Equal Opportunity Commission, I want to reiterate publicly our support for expanding the Equal Opportunity Act to provide this kind of protection and to expand the bases on which people can insist on equality of treatment in our national landscape. I do want to say one thing about a recent court case, which is that on April 14th, the EOC won a landmark judgment in relation to a case on sexual harassment, where the Court of Appeal uh, ruled that, uh, um, that sexual harassment forms um, can be covered under discrimination on the basis of sex. And in that context, we can now deal with cases of sexual harassment that were being, uh, claims of sexual harassment that were being made to us. And um, in that sense, the Equal Opportunity Act is the only legislation that provides a remedy for those who are victims of sexual harassment. Of course, we continue to advocate for there to be national legislation on sexual harassment as well. It's important in our context to mention that the appellate judges made it clear that one's sexual orientation has no bearing on whether or not a person can access the EOC and lodge a complaint and seek redress if they were sexually harassed. That means regardless of your sexual orientation, you have a right to go to the EOC um, if it is you are experiencing discrimination on the basis of sex through an experience of sexual harassment. And I think that that is an excellent, uh, we make cracks in the heteronormative legislative family of, of, um, of you know, the, the family of legislation that exists in Trinidad and Tobago. And these are all important um, breadcrumbs in, in us creating that path to ultimately having real equality protected by law. Uh, that said, it should be noted that if uh, um, someone such as a manager is discriminating, is sexually harassing both female and male employees, that it would not constitute discrimination on the basis of sex. And so that is why there needs to be much more comprehensive sexuality. Um, sexual harassment legislation. I'd like to just speak for a moment on behalf of the Equal Opportunity Commission, which is to say that we recently implemented the model LGBTI plus workplace policy, which was led by CAISO, in which the EOC collaborated and other partners, and that we call on stakeholders to do the same. We continue to work very closely with Pride TT and all other partners, um, those here, um, who are part of the LGBTI community, including transgender persons and transgender uh, advocacy organizations. We have been uh, hosting and uh, a monthly series with TTT titled Sex and Prejudice, where we have been raising issues of um, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation um, I spoke at the first one, and Dr. Angelique Nixon of Kaiso spoke at the second one and raised those issues. And for Pride Month, we hope to share that platform with the LGBTI plus community. And um, Pride TT approached us last year to collaborate on a project that can help to enhance our own advocacy. And in the course of July, we hope to be able to make an announcement that we will finally be able to start that project. And the goal is to strengthen the EOC's own advocacy for legislative change to the Act, 
in support of our um, in support of those in the CSO community who have been calling for this. Um, these are important comments because very often people can be frustrated by the EOC's inability to provide redress for valid experiences of sexual discrimination of sexual orientation discrimination. But it is important to keep in mind that the EOC must remain within the remit of the Equal Opportunity Act. And therefore, advocacy needs to be directed at the Attorney General, who can then take uh, an amendment to Parliament to amend the legislation. The previous Attorney General was unwilling to make these amendments and was waiting for the Jones v. TT case to uh, be decided at the Privy <coughs> Council. However, we do need to keep in mind that Parliament has a sovereign authority to change laws whenever it chooses. And so we can continue to hold Parliament responsible for the laws of the land and to argue that where there is discrimination and where there is a failure to provide inclusive legislation, that that is the responsibility of our legislators to do. Speaking just for a second, in my other hat, as a senior lecturer at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, I recently supervised an MSc thesis, which is now on the examination stage, by Pete Roderick, uh, one of our students, one of our graduate students. And he, his project wrote about um, his interviews with seven persons who were lesbian or gay, who were working in organizations in Trinidad and Tobago, primarily multinational organizations in Trinidad and Tobago. And he looked at their experiences of disclosure, when and under what conditions and for what reasons they decided to be open about their sexuality. He looked at uh, how they felt in their workplace environments, feelings of hesitation, feelings of fear, um, as well as feelings of acceptance and comfort. He looked at their, at the, at these employees' desires to have equal access to benefits, for example, insurance benefits, um, and to have their partners be considered there um, in the same way that uh, heterosexual partners are seen and acknowledged. And he also uh, concluded that workplace policies themselves are absolutely crucial. Uh, equality and non-discrimination policies, equality, diversity and inclusive and inclusion policies are absolutely crucial in a context where there is not sufficient legislative protection. And so it's very important that we have the business community on board, improving their own policies within their own businesses in order to provide those protections for their employees, which of course creates better employees and better businesses. But it is also important that as the private sector comes on board in a way that CSOs have led um, at least over the last decade, that the voices that are calling on the government to amend the Equal Opportunity Act, and of course the EOC is in support of that advocacy, that the voices become strengthened so that we can see that there is a national community and constituency that supports this, and that this can in fact empower the EOC to do what it is meant to do, which is to protect us all from experiences of discrimination without bias, without prejudice, and, um, and in ways that are truly inclusive. So my goal here today was simply to explain what the EOC can and can't do to help you to identify what kinds of advocacy and to whom we should be engaging, to reiterate the absolute support of the Equal Opportunity Commission 
for the expansion of the Equal Opportunity Act and to say that we continue to advocate for this ourselves and our com continued commitment to the LGBTI, LGBTQI community to let this community know that uh, in within our mandate, which is in terms of research and public education and public engagement, and certainly in terms of the internal policies of the EOC, we will continue to do as much as we can to enhance a national landscape that is non-discriminatory. So I thank you all. Date and your message. So just to recall, as she said, really, so we have to continue in front of parliament, essentially. So we have um, some representatives who we will continue to, as she said, we don't have to wait for the Privy Council to judge on Jason Jones's case. That's his case. Um, so we're back on parliament again later on this month, next month, we're back in front of parliament. Okay. Wonderful people. So stay alert for that. So we would like to once more say thank you very much to the members and the representatives of the diplomatic mission.